Uh, Makla, if you want to double check that, um, but I believe we should be live. So, um, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Rex Darty. I am the artistic director of uh, theater at Solus Nua, and I am so thrilled uh, to welcome all of you here today for this event. Uh, we are celebrating and delighted to celebrate both Black History Month in Ireland, as well as the 175th anniversary of Frederick Douglass's tour of Ireland. Um, Stolas Nua, in association with the Embassy of Ireland, Washington, D.C., have partnered together to present a look back on our award-winning production of the Frederick Douglass Project, as well as a conversation about the play, but also about the importance of multicultural projects and international partnerships. A little bit about the original project. In 2018, Solis Nua commissioned Irish playwright Deirdre Kinahan, hi D and African-American playwright Salma Yene 24, hi Sam, to tell the story of Frederick Douglass's historic trip to Ireland. Solis Nua staged the play on a floating pier on the Anacostia River, overlooking Douglass's home on Cedar Hill. The production under the direction of Raymond O. Caldwell, hi Raymond, received international recognition in the Irish Times. It was aired on RTE Irish TV. It was listed as one of the best theater productions of the year by the Washington Post, Washington City Paper, DC Theater Scene, and DC Metro Theater Arts. The play earned six Helen Hayes Award nominations, including Outstanding Original New Play, and it was the recipient of the Helen Hayes Award for Outstanding Ensemble. In addition to the members of the creative team, who I'll introduce in just a little bit later, we're joined by two distinguished guests who were also proud partners and sponsors of our 2018 theater production. And I wanna thank Irish Ambassador Dan Mulhall and Nettie Washington Douglas for your time today, as well as your deeply valued partnership over the years. Um, Nettie Washington Douglas is the co-founder and co-chair of Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and a director of the Frederick Douglass Ireland Project, as well as the great-great-granddaughter of Frederick Douglass and great-granddaughter of Booker T. Washington. We're thrilled you are here, yeah. Nettie. <laughs> um, uh, and Ambassador Mulhall, uh, uh, you unfortunately have to follow up that introduction, um, but uh, uh, we're also thrilled uh, that the, the embassy here in Washington, D.C. was a partner uh, in the original production and a sponsor of the show. Uh, and Ambassador Mulhall, we're so thankful you're here. Uh, and I want to introduce you. If we were live, we, I would welcome everyone to give you a round of applause. Uh, but uh, Ambassador Mulhall, thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rex. It's, very, it's a great honor and privilege to be here uh, at this event. and. Um, I want to, first of all, pay a warm tribute to uh, Celis Nua for the work that you do in promoting Irish arts here in the Washington area. And uh, I'm glad that we've been able to uh, support your innovative productions and that we've been able to provide some funding from our government's immigrant support program to, um, to enable you to, uh, to um, uh, develop your, your programs and to, to uh, provide a um, uh, very good um, service for for people in Washington who are interested in all Irish art forms and I've had great pleasure myself in attending a number of your events including of course uh, that great event when you performed the uh, Freddie Douglas project down on the uh, down on the jetty there and uh, when we were able to look over at Frederick Douglass's house um, and um, I would also pay tribute of course to the directors and the the cast of the uh, play which was certainly uh, and also the authors because it was a great privilege to be there that evening. It was one of those uh, magical evenings. We sat outside under the stars and uh, watched the really first class uh, um, plays, or first class series of plays being produced uh, before us and done in a beautifully innovative way with uh, using the space uh, brilliantly to, to put across this, uh, this fantastic story of Frederick Douglass's uh, visit to Ireland. Uh, sh shortly after that um, visit, or uh, after I attended the play, in um, Washington at that time, I decided to visit the, the Douglas House across the river. And I went over there and the thing I, I witnessed that day, which really intrigued me was, um, they showed me some artifacts and they brought out a framed, uh, very elaborate um, um, bit of calligraphy, which was an address of welcome to Frederick Douglas when he visited Cork in 1845. He was in Cork around this time, actually, in 1845. 
And the thing that intrigued me most of all was that at the bottom of the, the text, it said, presented to Frederick Douglass by the anti-slavery societies of Cork, which means that in 1845, the city of Cork, the second Irish city, third actually at that time, because Belfast was the second, um, uh, the country was still uh, together, um, was that in Cork, with perhaps 100,000 inhabitants, there were at least two and probably more societies devoted to the cause of opposing slavery. And that, that really opened my eyes and, and uh, gave me a sense of pride, actually. That, And when I um, delved into Christine Keneally's uh, wonderful books about Douglas's visit to Ireland, what I realized was that all over Ireland, there were people and organizations deeply dedicated to the cause of opposing slavery. And that included the great Daniel O'Connell, the great Irish liberator, who spoke in, in fervent terms in opposition to slavery and was one of the leading European voices against slavery. And Douglas met him, of course, in September of 1845. So I'm proud of the fact that our people in 1845 had a view of slavery, which was not a view that was held the world over. You know, there were many people at that time who uh, supported slavery. Indeed, there were Irish Americans here in this country who supported slavery. But in Ireland, the opposition to slavery was fervent and widespread. And that, I think, is something we can be proud of. And the second reason why I'm, I'm, um, pr I'm pleased about this celebration of Frederick Douglass' historic visit to Ireland is because his visit and the anniversary that we're now celebrating comes at a time when Ireland itself is undergoing an incredible transformation. One in six people who live in Ireland today were not born in our country. And we have increasing numbers of people from all over the world who are now come to settle in Ireland because we can now provide jobs and livelihoods for people. For people. We couldn't provide for our own people 50, 60, 100 years ago or more when people emigrated in large numbers. Now Irish, Irish people are attracting others from overseas, from all around the world to come and live in Ireland. And therefore we need for the first time in our history to deal with the, the challenges of having a multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic society. And so far we're doing quite well. In that we don't have an anti-immigrant movement. We don't have uh, groups who are campaigning to bring immigration to a halt. And that is something that I'm quite proud of. And the Douglas heritage reminds us of how important um, opposition to slavery was in Ireland 175 years ago, when we were a much poorer and less developed country. So I think for those reasons, I'm happy to be involved in, in marking and celebrating the anniversary of Douglas's visit to Ireland. And we have indeed a, a, a program of events um, uh, we planned. Uh, one is, of course, we have a launch next week of Christine Keneally's book on black abolitionists in Ireland, because she has told the story there of, I think, 10 or more black abolitionists who came to Ireland between the 1780s and the 1850s. Douglas was the most famous of those visitors, but others came too. And all of them were received with a positive response from the Irish people. So it's genuine privilege and pleasure to be involved in this. And I also want to say that we're now, the Irish government's now supporting the Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship. We'll be bringing a number of Frederick Douglass fellows to Ireland next year, all going well, hoping that the world will have returned to some kind of normality by then. Um, and I want now to, uh, to introduce Nettie Washington Douglas. Um, we go back quite a long way because uh, when I was in Germany in, um, in about 10 years ago, I came across the fact that Daniel O'Connell was highly revered in Germany at that time as an advocate of peaceful uh, political reform. And I was invited to go to the Daniel O'Connell Summer School uh, in Derry Nan, the home of O'Connell in uh, Kerry on the west coast of Ireland, on Ireland's wild Atlantic way. And I shared a platform that day to my great pleasure with, with uh, Nettie Washington Douglas. And that was when I became more fully aware of the Douglas connection with O'Connell and of Douglas's visit to Ireland. And since that time, I've taken more and more of an interest in that subject. And so it's, and I've had quite a few contacts with Nettie in the intervening period uh, in London and also here in Washington. We had the pleasure of, of hosting her at the embassy uh, about a year back when we were also um, doing an event uh, connected with Douglas's visit to Ireland. So on this, the 175th anniversary of 
Douglas's visit to Ireland uh, and um, on behalf of the embassy and uh, my colleagues, it is a pleasure and privilege to invite Nettie Washington Douglas to address us. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Hello, and thank you so much for including me in this wonderful event. I'm delighted to be with all of you. Thank you for being here, Ambassador Mohall. Your interest in Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists and their experiences in Ireland and your support for events like this is very much appreciated. And a huge thank you to you, Rex, and to the cast and crew of the Frederick Douglass Project for developing and staging this production. Thank you. And also, again, congratulations on your awards. As has been mentioned, my name is Nettie Washington Douglas, and I am uh, Frederick Douglass is my great great grandfather, and as was mentioned, Booker T. Washington is my great grandfather. I am co founder and co chair of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and a director of the Frederick Douglass Ireland Project, and we were thrilled to be able to support this production. I am in Atlanta and unfortunately was not able to see the play myself in person, but I've been privileged to see some video. My son, Kenneth Morris, met and talked with the cast and crew during rehearsals, and Kristen Leary from the Douglas Ireland Project saw the play several times, and I have heard great things. I just love that the play was staged on the Anacostia River with a view to Douglas's home at Cedar Hill just across the water, a special place for Douglas his wife, Anna, my great-great-grandmother, and their family. The story of Frederick Douglass in Ireland, the welcome he received there, and the transformation he himself said he underwent is so important today. And I'm so glad that it continues to provide inspiration to so many people. I've been very lucky to travel to Ireland several times, and I know what Frederick Douglass meant. I have felt so warmly welcomed there myself. As a matter of fact, I'd just like to share a brief story. Um, my first visit, I was asked to speak at an event and I didn't know I was gonna be speaking there until I was introduced. And it was, oh my goodness, what am I gonna say? But then it came to me, I wanted to share something that happened to me years ago uh, that kind of helped me um, understand why people wanted to hug me and kiss me, especially when I was a little girl. And the lady expressed to me, uh, the impact that both of my ancestors had on her. And she said, Nettie, I would love to be able to hug Frederick Douglass and thank him, hug Booker Washington and thank them for what they did for me to improve my life. And so I passed that forward and I said to the audience, I want to be able to do the same thing to your ancestors. So to all of you out there that are viewing that are Irish, have any DNA as I do, Irish DNA, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for what your ancestors did for my great great grandfather for the time that he was in Ireland for the first time in his life. And he had to go outside of his own country to have this happen. He was treated like a human being. You know, you read his books and I even had my grandmother tell me stories that my grandfather shared about how he felt walking down the streets of Ireland, not having to look over his shoulder, wondering if the slave catcher was gonna be behind him having an Irish man, a white man come up to him, extend his hand, look my great, great grandfather in the eyes and call him Mr. Douglas. And I tear up every time I say it because um, it just means so much to me. So I made a promise after I, I made these remarks that evening, several people came up to me and they had tears. In fact, I saw men in the audience wiping tears away and they made me promise that if I ever meet, whenever I meet an Irish person to please share that story. So I am keeping my promise and I just thank everybody for making my grandfather feel so welcome. And I think this play is so interesting because it takes place as Douglas is traveling to Ireland and anticipating what he will find there, what his reaction will be and whether his journey will be successful. It's a wonderful way to present Douglas as a young man. I applaud all of you for the incredible work you've done on this play. And I thank you again for allowing me to be a part of this program. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is, um, I'm wiping away my own tears here in, 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 the, in the audience. So thank you for sharing that. It was really powerful. 
uh, and uh, we unfortunately have to follow that. Um, but uh, but we'll 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 soldier on. I want to introduce Raymond Caldwell, um, who is the artistic director of Theater Alliance, proudly displayed in his background there. Um, but uh, Raymond uh, was the director of the Frederick Douglass Project, and I, I'm, uh, he's going to host uh, the, the sort of the next part of uh, today's program with both the actors and, and our two playwrights. Uh, so Raymond, I'll let you um, go ahead and introduce everyone else. Um, if you uh, want to turn off your cameras, if you are not one of the creative team, um, go ahead and do that just so we have a, a bigger picture of, of the, the panelists. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll just keep going. So Raymond, over to you, thank you. So thank you so much, Rex, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I, I feel incredibly honored to be here. I told the cast and Rex when we got together for rehearsal, it's so rare that we get to get the band together again when we're in this form, when we're in this art form. It's so rare that shows get this second life. And so the opportunity to come back to this piece is a real gift. Uh, I will say that narratives about African-Americans in Europe uh, is, is so close to my own heart because I think it parallels my own experience. Uh, I, I am African-American, but lived in Germany. I am also German and lived in Germany for quite some time. So these complex narratives about multiculturalism are, are a core part of the art that I not only direct, but also produce. Uh, I think these opportunities for conversations about global multiculturalism actually ask us to expand the conversation even more. And so I'm absolutely in love with the work uh, that, that we were able to produce. Uh, our two playwrights from separate parts of the world coming together to write a narrative uh, that, that was really just dope and so much fun to do. And so we are so excited to share some of it today. So I wanna just go ahead and frame what's going to happen. We're gonna go ahead and see two excerpts. The first excerpt is uh, from Psalms, part of the Frederick Douglass Project. And right after that, I will engage Psalm in a very quick question to start this idea conversation about multiculturalism. Then we'll see Dee's excerpt, which was the second part of the Frederick Douglass Project. And then I'll engage Dee in a question. And then hopefully we have enough time thereafter to engage everyone in, in a fuller conversation about this work. So that's the way we are going to operate. I am going to go ahead and turn my camera off and I'm going to invite our playwrights as well to turn their cameras off so that we then just have the actors left and I'm going to leave it to the actors and the team to take it away. Part one of the Frederick Douglass Project. An eloquent fugitive slave flees to Ireland by Samayene 24. Susan stands on the first class deck of the Cambria. She pretends to be sick to avoid the captain who is checking for first class tickets. Frederick Douglass watches knowingly. I'm glad you're feeling better, miss. I ain't sick. I figured that. Just because I can't afford a first-class ticket doesn't mean I should be deprived of first-class experiences. I agree. You do? Certainly. I believe, in God's eyes, we are all first-class citizens. All of us? Unquestionably, yes. Men and women alike with equal freedoms? A large number of men might disagree, but in many respects, I believe women to be the superior sex. <laughs> I like you. I'm Susan Cahill. I'm Frederick Douglass. I know who you are. I've heard women from anti-slavery groups talking about you at the um, ice cream stand. The ice cream stand? At the circus back home in New York. That's where I work. I sell ice cream and my father is a lion tamer. Uh, you know, if I were born a boy, I'd be a lion tamer too. But father says that staring down the treacherous throat of a circus lion is no life for a woman. Mm, I say it's no harder than dealing with some men. Ah, indeed. Some men are more dangerous than the fiercest of beasts. But I do sometimes feel sorry for the poor lions. 
to be prodded and lashed and put in cages is no kind of existence. Tell me about it. Uh, they say you give riveting speeches with words that take flight as if they had wings. I've never heard you give one, but I'm a big fan. You're even better looking than they say. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure's mine. They shake hands. I've never touched a slave before. I'm not a slave. Oh, but isn't your book called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave? Marketing. Truth is, I was never a slave. No? No, I was enslaved. There's a difference. So are you free? That's a simple question with a complicated answer. No, it's a straightforward question with an uncomplicated answer. Yes or no? Right now, on the upper deck of the Cambria sailing towards Ireland, I am free. Free like the gusty gales rocking this ship to and fro. Free like that barn swallow, migrating where it pleases. Free like you, pretending to be sick. But according to the laws of America, I am a slave, property of another man who was my equal. So you're in the presence of one waging a quiet internal war, moment by precious moment, undetected by your sparkling eyes. Complicated. So why are you going to Ireland? I'll be giving anti-slavery speeches and building support as I plead the cause for the oppressed black men and women. I've named former masters in my book so slave catchers are surely on the hunt for me. Some time in Ireland will give me much welcome respite. Why are you going? It's where my family's from, Cork to be exact. My granny's not doing well, she's on her last legs. I'm sorry to hear that. I'll be in Cork during my stay in, in October, I believe. He pulls iron shackles from his bag along with his schedule. Yes, on October 10th, I'll be speaking at the Temperance Institute on Academy Street. Ah, I know where that is. Maybe I'll see you there. What are those? These used to be my slave shackles. I sometimes brandish them when giving speeches to illustrate the horror of slavery. They have a powerful effect on audiences. Can I touch them? Sure. The heavy and cold. Yes. Those used to be fastened about my wrist. Strange how the instruments of my oppression are now used as inspiration in my struggle for freedom. Susan puts the shackles on her wrists. Before no, Frederick Susan. can stop her, she locks them. What? Once locked, those can be quite difficult to open. Don't you have a key? Me having a key wouldn't make these shackles, shackles very effective. <sighs> Please get these off me. Okay, calm down, calm down. I just need a hammer and a wedge. Oh, wait right here. Oh, don't leave me. I'll be right back. Breathe and look out into the ocean. When I return, I'll free you. You promise? I promise. Frederick exits to retrieve a hammer and wedge. Okay, place the chains on the deck. Will it hurt? No. Stay rooted right where you are and don't move an inch. Frederick puts the wedge on one of the shackles. He raises the hammer. Remember, you can't move. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't help it. That's fine. Be still now, okay? Okay. Susan. Sorry, I got scared. Breathe. Good. Now close your eyes. What? Close your eyes and no peeking. She closes her eyes. Frederick raises the hammer 
and strikes the wedge. It makes a loud clink, but Susan does not move or open her eyes. Suddenly, a soundscape of hammers, chains, and chants are heard. Frederick exists for the audience in both the past and the present. As the shackle gets struck by the hammer, hitting crazy hard, like my English grammar. I'm a bad man, a gemma, not a Pollyanna, and I'm way more gangster than Tony Montana. And this downstroke might go viral. I'm blaming. I think we lost Gary. We'll give him just one second to come back. Hi there. Um, I think we've lost Gary. It looked like his computer might have fallen. Um, uh, hi, Raymond. Oh no! Oh no! But yeah, live. it doesn't look. Yeah, it's live, folks. Live. It's live. Uh, I, I think live, that that yeah. gives us actually an opportunity to like just segue eke into a conversation, and then if and when Gary pops back in, we'll actually hear the rest of that verse with a little more context. So I actually love that as a segue. Uh, so we'll thank Transition. we'll thank the Zoom gods for making that happen. <laughs> Uh, I'm so excited now to just have this brief conversation with Salma Any24. I will share that uh, I have been a long time fan and friend of Psalms. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with Psalm and directing a lot of his work. Um, you know, I, I am so excited to be in DC at this moment with Psalm and, and over the last 12 years, really exploring like hip hop theater. Uh, and, and so I, I want to pose this question actually, actually for you, Psalm, you know, uh, hip hop as an art form is deeply collaborative, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Modern hip hop, particularly hip hop now of this moment is really starting to fuse in these conversations of multiculturalism, particularly mm -hmm. as we start seeing hip hop spread all over the world. We're seeing yep. hip hop in Germany now, hip hop in China, hip hop in J Japan. And so yep. as we're starting to see all of this, I wonder how hip hop and where hip hop squares with your exploration in the Frederick Douglass project. Why this use of hip hop? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when when I was re uh, researching uh, for the piece, uh, I ended up reading a book about Douglas's journey to Ireland. And like a lot of people, I didn't even know he had gone to Ireland and that his Irish journey, that was a pivotal sort of turning point in his development as a, as a thinker and as a human being. Uh, and in doing my research, I, I began to see him as this sort of uh, rock star, rap star figure who was able to really use language in a way to propel him out of oppression. I mean, he, he was on a speaking tour prior to leaving the States and then he was sent over to Ireland as a, to sort of gain refuge because there was a lot of heat on him at that time. And then he went on a speaking tour in Europe and then throughout different parts of Ireland. So there's this idea of using language as a means to uh, pull yourself up out of a bad situation, which is in the DNA of hip hop. Um, also, there's this idea of using the culture to bridge gaps and uh, cross gulfs that exist between different groups. When hip hop was started in the Bronx in the early um, 70s, it, it actually was a multicultural sort of environment. I mean, you had African Americans, you had Caribbean Americans, Latinx, you had some white kids, some Asian kids were peppered in there. So, so it's always been this means of sort of bridging people who were um, on different spectrums. 
I love that. I love that. Uh, this is a great moment also now that we have him back to introduce our actors as well. Uh, Gary Perkins the third as Frederick Douglass and oh, Madeline you. Mooney as Susan K. Hill. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> so I wonder if actually we can just uh, get back into that text in here. Now that we hear the context of how and why hip hop is used in this first part of the play, I love this modern element. This is something that D as well does in the second part and we'll have a conversation about that. Um, but I know that as we were doing the Frederick Douglass project, this first part of the play, I think audiences often were regularly shocked and surprised by the use of hip hop, particularly when Frederick Douglass began rapping. And, and so I actually would love to jump in. Hey, Gary, can we go ahead and take it again from that cue into the rap and then hear that rap all the way through? Uh, yeah. Cool. Let's go ahead and just finish out and we'll hear the end of the play and we'll get that final button. Great. Um, Frederick raises the hammer and strikes the wedge. It makes a loud clink, but Susan does not move or open her eyes. Suddenly a soundscape of hammers, chains, and chants are heard. Frederick exists for the audience in both the past and the present. As the shackle gets struck by the hammer, hitting crazy hard, like my English grammar. I'm a bad mamma jamma, not a Pollyanna. And I'm way more gangster than Tony Montana. And this downstroke might go viral. I'm blazing through history like a pyro. Being a great liberator is my role. Now I'm about to go back like spinal. Back to the year 1824. Back to my early days on the Eastern Shore. I was just a small child. Young and immature. Rest assured I had no clue what life had in store. Back then, my best friend was my grandmama. Getting separated from her was major trauma. She was my everything, my angel and my Dalai Lama. She was my Oprah Winfrey and my Michelle Obama. Slavery pulled families asunder. It's no wonder that we're still dealing with all the blunders. Soon come time before the lightning and thunder repay the evil crimes with the crashing number. But in a bit, you'll be free from these old school handcuffs. I hope your temporary bondage was enough to help you understand how cruel and how tough the circumstance is that I've been speaking of. The shackle opens. Got it. You can open your eyes now. <sighs> Thank God, I'm free. Yes, you are. End of excerpt. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you both of the actors for pushing through and getting to that end. And thank you always. It's so good to always see you both perform together. I love your chemistry. Uh, as we start transitioning into this next play in part two, a psalm, you know, I, I love the idea of Douglas being a rap star, right? And, and, and particularly in the way that he uses language and used language in his period and of his time. Um, I suppose, can you talk about like, what was the most surprising thing you learned about Douglas this time in Ireland uh, that he was uh, he had groupies essentially a lot of people talked about how good looking he was and that's why I put that line in in the play because oftentimes in pictures we we see like the the older distinguished Douglas but he was really a, a very handsome man and that part of him is not something that is in the popular iconography when it comes to Douglas. So uh, yeah, his, his, his swag and, and his sort of charisma and ability also to mimic different voices is something that he also did in his speeches. So, so that also surprised me. Mm -hmm. I love the, you know, the thing that I, I loved the most is learning that he purposefully was being political about his image and being the most photo like photographed man of his period. There's something like so quintessentially hip hop to me about that. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, like that is ultimate swag. Like you're going to have my picture. <laughs> yeah. 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 He, he totally was, was aware of sort of, um, his presence in the world and then his presence in history because even this this idea of not smiling a lot like saying no because things are serious right now so history needs to remember that we were about getting work done so I mean that's something else that I 
also learned and that's and that's fast you know it's fascinating about him and Con Kanye West has also now sometimes has said you, you know I don't smile in pictures and and I think he got that from Douglas actually yeah yeah, I, I love, love, love that parallel. That That is mm -hmm. such a dope parallel. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that it, it is a really nice transition. You know, the, the play as a whole, interestingly enough, Psalm really focuses on Douglas's journey. So that is that part one takes place on the voyage to Ireland. And I think in this really nice way, Dee's piece picks up as Douglas is in Ireland. I love that as we were in the writing phase and the development phase, these are just places the two of you seemingly ran. And, and there were whole moments in that early development process. I, I particularly remember that first workshop, we would come together and, and to see the parallels that were happening literally across the ocean, uh, surrounded and, and tied to Douglas, just utterly amazing. And so I think this gets us into our second excerpt. Um, I, I will say that I have been a long, long time fan of Dee and, and, and her work. Um, and, and so the opportunity to know that she was working on this project was just oh so dope. And so I actually would love to jump in and hear that excerpt and then come back and ask Dee a very purposeful question connected to the conversation we've started with Psalm. So I will go off camera and I'll hand it back over to the actors and we will hear part two. Part two of the Frederick Douglass Project. Wild Notes by Deirdre Kinahan. A woman stands on the quayside, on the quayside singing. Her name is Margaret. She is singing the crappy boy, an old Irish rebel song. Frederick Douglass is walking along the quayside. He is caught by her singing. When she finishes her song, he throws a coin into her cup. May I inquire as to the nature of your song? Didn't you hear it? Or why'd you throw me your guinea? Pardon me? Perhaps I should alter my question. I'm curious to know, what is a crappy boy? A crappy boy. A crappy boy is a rebel, sir. A rebel? Yes. What class of a rebel? The class that wants freedom, sir. Freedom? Of course. Freedom from what? <sighs> Where is it that you're from, sir? Why do you ask? Because it's clear that you know nothing of Ireland. Indeed. Indeed. I know very little of Ireland as I only recently arrived. I see. Please, tell me about this crappy boy. Why? Or is there a crappy girl, perhaps? I'm sure there was an army, crappy girls, but who would bother to take up a tune in their name? Would you not take up the pen yourself to tell their story? I'm afraid I'm a little too occupied with staying alive, sir. Staying alive? Are conditions here really so bad? Haven't you two eyes in your head? Look around this key and tell me what you see. I see. I admit I see great wretchedness here. Indeed, you do. But I confess I do not understand it. Oh, it's a puzzle, all right, sir. It's a puzzle to see Irish men, women, and children roam here amidst the debris and filth half starved and about to be evicted from their own country. It's a puzzle to see them board ships not fit for a dog at the behest of their government and landlords. It is a puzzle to see their eyes wild with want and their lips green from soaking grass. It's a puzzle to see their bellies swollen from famine when these ships that stand along the quay are bursting with Irish grain, bursting with Irish wheat and Irish horses, seed and cattle. But these ships are bound for Liverpool, sir and their bounty is bound for the English gut. The Irish, the Irish are left to die here along the quay or in their fields. But why? Because Ireland is but a colony, sir. Ireland serves her English master. Don't you know that? Don't you know that those men you walked with earlier support an English monarch and care nothing for us, nothing for me? You saw me earlier. I did. And I saw the English masters that you walked with the same masters that killed my crappy boy and abandoned the likes of me to the coffin ships. Coffin ships? Why do you call them coffin ships? 
because most of us die in them, sir. Packed into a dozen in the cattle hold. Most of us never reach the new world, but find our future with the fishes in the forgotten depths of the ocean. But this is terrible, if it is true. Why would you doubt me, sir? Why indeed? May I ask your name? You may. What is your name? My name is Margaret, sir. Margaret Keene. It's a pleasure to be acquainted with you, Margaret Keene. What is yours? My name is Frederick Douglass. May God bless you, Frederick Douglass. You appear to be educated, despite your poor condition. Is that such a surprise? No, no. Please do not misunderstand me. I know what it is to be judged by appearance, to be presumed ignorant, incapable of philosophy or thought. Do you? I do. Well, it doesn't take a philosopher to see wretchedness, sir, nor to understand greed behind it. Greed? Greed. It's the only explanation for what England does to me and mine. But how then are you educated? Because my father was a school teacher. Is that so? It is. And his classroom was a ditch because England doesn't want the likes of me to be book reading and England doesn't want the likes of me to understand her politics or her greed. I was a teacher myself once. Were you? Yes. Sunday school. I taught Sunday school in Maryland, also from a ditch. Yet I believe they were the happiest days of my life. And what's you now, sir, if not a teacher? What am I now? Yes. I am. I am a writer. I am a speaker. I speak here in Ireland. Speak? Yes. Well, that's a grand job altogether. What is it that you speak of? My life. My life in slavery. Slavery? Yes. But where is it that you're from, sir? I'm from the United States of America. America? Yes. But that's where I'm going. Seems to me that that's where every wretched here is going. Well, of course it is. Sure isn't it only in America that you'll find a gentleman the likes of yourself? A gentleman that's as black as the night. They say that America is a place where anything can happen, where anyone can find sanctuary or hope. Who says that? Every wretch. Now I'm the one who thinks you know nothing of America. Why do you say that? How can you say that, sir? When America, America's the dream. To dream is a powerful thing. In America, I am a slave. In America, I am chattel that can be bought or sold. In America, I can be flogged or starved or murdered with no law to protect me. In America, I am less than a man. Less than a woman? Less than a free woman. I won't. I don't believe you, sir. What I say is true. But on what account? On the count of the color of my skin. Will you describe it to me, Frederick Douglass? Will you describe this slavery? It, it is a great evil. It makes beast of us all. All, sir. You stand here and sing, Margaret. You sing to me of subjugation, of injustice, of class. And in America, you may well be liberated from your poverty and your race, but not on merit alone. Not because of your humanity, but simply because you are white. But what is white, sir? What is white? What is white? White is power, Margaret. White is murder. White is lies. White is money. White is cruelty. Great cruelty, boundless cruelty. White is the whip. White is the gun. White is its own ruination, Margaret, because deep down, deep in the bowels of white humanity, they know that slavery is wrong. Must be, sir. I wonder. I wonder, will you feel the same when you see the power it might grant you? I wonder, will you beat the slave yourself? Never. Some of your kin do. My kin? There are Irish slavers, Irish drivers, Margaret. 
Irish men and women who would crush their black brother in order to find an American foothold of their own. And they've lost their soul, Frederick Douglass. And they've forgotten who they are. End of excerpt. Awesome, awesome. I just want to shout out our actors again, Gary Perkins III and Madeline Mooney. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and Madeline playing two characters. I, I, I love that. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about the Frederick Douglass project as a whole, I love the idea that uh, in Psalm's play, Douglass is teaching Susan about like the de degradations of American slavery. Right, and, and, and Susan is, is hearing these things for the first time. Um, and, and Dee, in your play, Margaret is teaching Douglas about the degradations that are happening in Ireland. And Margaret is forced to grapple with this uh, concept that seems almost foreign to her, something that is unimaginable, this idea of whiteness. And, and you know, I, I just wanna like shout out the fact that this is something that we in America, particularly this summer, America has finally started to grapple with this idea of whiteness. And here you are two years ago, three years ago, actually grappling, having a character grapple with this idea. So I think that's not the question. I just wanna point that out because I think it's so important for us as artists to have the space to come back to pieces because it's coming back to pieces that we actually learn like, oh, wow, look, D was pointing to the future two years ago three years ago, so that's really dope. Uh, but the question that I have for you about your piece, you know, what we don't see in, in this really complex back and forth between Mar Margaret and Frederick, what we don't see in the excerpt is that you also include uh, what you called while we were working on it, these series of bombs. These, you introduce audiences to three characters of the modern moment who are dealing with genocide, human trafficking, um, and the prison industrial complex. And randomly like, the Margaret and Frederick are talking and then suddenly a modern character, boom, appears. A, a character from perhaps another time and, and often somewhere else further in the world. And so I wonder if you can talk about the relativity of these modern characters and what those bombs or, or those moments where you're discussing human trafficking, genocide, uh, and the prison industrial complex, what those have to do and how those are interrelated to Frederick Douglass and, and the multiculturalism that we're talking about today. Sure. Well, God, it was really lovely to hear that again, I have to say. And great performances from Gary and Madeline. Um, yeah, real joy. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, it was an extraordinary experience um, writing. Uh, like, I, I felt so humble and so privileged to be asked to, to, to write a play about one of Africa, African Americans, you know, great heroes and such an extraordinary individual. And um, I suppose for me at the time, it was because every history play is always really about the present. I think that the, the impulse was not to create something, probably a little bit like Sam having the same impulse across the ocean unbeknownst to me, but not to consign Frederick Douglass that story or that struggle to the past. But, but to really kind of bring it front and center and to show how it echoes and, and how it unfortunately still lives with us now. So I suppose what was really interesting for me was the whole notion of freedom. God, and when you think about how present that is today uh, in our present world with, you know, anti-maskers, you know, claiming that it in some way violates their freedoms in order to protect others. I think that whole notion of freedom of what it is and what it means and what it means to different people was really crucial to me. And then that kind of brought me to the, to the notion of, uh, of contemporary slavery, you know? And again, when I was growing up in Ireland in the 70s and the 80s, I thought that the, the, the that the struggle for civil rights in America was something that happened in the 60s. I thought that slavery was something that happened in the 18th and 19th century. But here I find myself in the, the, the 2000s, you know, looking directly at slavery um, all around the world and looking directly at the abuse of civil rights 
all around the world. And there was just something about Frederick Douglass and, and his story and his connection with Ireland and the fact that he recognised in the Irish people a subjugation and an oppression which was not as dehumanising as that experienced by African-Americans, but was in some way akin to it. So I began to think about contemporary stories that really deeply affected me, that I felt echoed the same the, the same state and the same struggle. So uh, I had the, the, these characters that were kind of floating around, orbiting around my head, uh, and uh, that, that, that seemed to tell three different stories, but they are the story of Frederick Douglass. They are the story of every person who is beleaguered by, uh, by slavery. So the, the, the three characters, one was a, a Ugandan girl who was kidnapped um, by the Lord's Army in Uganda and was, um, you know, habitually raped and became a child soldier. Uh, and I think that whole history of the child soldier, you know, is so recent and it affected so many countries and it's little spoken of, but it, it, it just, it, I, wanted, I wanted her story to be a part of Frederick's, to be a part of this whole discussion. And then I was also aware of uh, one or two cases at the time in Ireland and England where very vulnerable uh, people, homeless people, people with um, special needs were um, basically kidnapped and put to work um, by, you know, really dodgy firms, tarmac adam, you know, tarmac adaming driveways or working in car washes and that kind of exploitation and that kind of trafficking, you know, of very vulnerable people. And then the final story, I suppose, was really, um, you know, kind of a, a, a Black Lives Matter of the moment story, which was that really tragic story of Khalif Bowder, who, um, you, you know, was arrested for apparently stealing a backpack, which he never stole, and uh, spent many years in prison, and um, then, then sadly committed suicide. And so those three stories kind of I, I, I segued or fused them into this kind of a deeply philosophical conversation that was happening between these two historical characters. And I suppose it added drama and added tension. And it was also a, a nice way to kind of integrate music. Uh, and of course, Sam was integrating music at the other side of the Atlantic as well. So it was amazing those kind of crossings. Mm -hmm. I, I love the deep, uh, those really multicultural moments, those deep aha moments that I think we all had, uh, that you both were seemingly writing such music and very specific music into both of your plays that when fused really became one. I know one of uh, Rex's favorite moments is the discovering of the banjo and this idea that the banjo is both an Irish instrument and an American instrument. Um, and, and so the fusing of that multiculturalism. And so I guess the question that I have next for both playwrights and also the actors, I think as we were going through the process, we learned a lot about multiculturalism and developing these types of multicultural narratives. Um, so I suppose, what were some of your favorite things that occurred? Those happy accidents or, or uh, yeah, those moments that were like, aha for you. Who's gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I suppose it, it was, I think what you're always trying to do in theater is cut through to the humanity. And I think that that's what Sam was doing and that's what I was doing, you know, and it's, it's a very particular thing to be commissioned, uh, you know, with, with such a target, you know, let's talk about Frederick Douglass's trip to Ireland. And I think what was really fascinating for me was how Sam hit on the, the kind of the, the feminist impulse that was there in uh, Frederick Douglass, and I had hit on, it as, hit on it as well. And also the story, the beauty of the story of the memory of his grandmother. I remember being deeply affected by that as well. This woman who minded him and minded all the other children within that plantation. 
and 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 the, the the story of all those other characters you know that that were deeply aff affected by slavery both then and now so there were just a, a, an, an incredible kind of a ghostly number of connections really weren't there sam as if we were you know some divine force was pulling us together yeah yeah from from uh as uh, not sure if it was rex or Raymond, who mentioned, you, you know, me writing about the journey too, and then UD focusing on once Douglas lands there, that was just seamless and connected. Of course, the music, uh, you know, the parallels there. And then this idea of sort of a loose exploration of what it means to be an ally, which was interesting. And that was also something that I also discovered along my research, you, you know, white allies have been integral to the movement for struggle for, you know, since Douglas's day, which I didn't really know how much of a role they necessarily played. So that certainly opened my, my eyes. So to see sort of a whiteness through these two different characters just gave, gave the piece more, more texture. I, love it. I think, you know, one interesting thing for me, just sort of developing it with everyone and uh, was uh, specifically through the lens of sort of multiculturalism is really the importance of getting outside of your your own experience. Um, and I remember when, when Kenneth t spoke to the cast on the first day of rehearsal, Kenneth, the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, he said, you know, Douglass went to Ireland an abolitionist, but his experience there made him a human rights advocate. And he came back as a stronger ally for more causes. And I, you know, I think I've been thinking of Solus Nua, particularly because we have this Irish mission statement, but we're here in, in Washington, DC. Um, you know, what does it mean for us to have a international voice? And for me, I've been thinking of like, well, art is without borders and we can have cultural exchange and, and conversations across economic and, and ethnic lines and the arts can lead that, um, that conversation. And the, it's just the importance of um, international work and, and uh, multicultural work of, of getting outside of your own perspective, which was so at the heart of, of this, this commission of, of asking two playwrights to, to jointly tell this story. want to create some space for Gary yeah. or Madeline as well if they have anything to jump in and add in. I go ahead. I'll take it. I <laughs> cool. Uh, I will say that I, I you know I think that the thing that excited me a, a lot about this project was this idea of multiculturalism. I had just gotten back from India, um, and while in India, I was working with a subset of artists to create art and theater around gender-based violence and the normalization of gender-based violence, particularly in Southeast Asia. And so it was so interesting to think about my ideas of gender-based violence and how gender-based violence shows up in my own society, my own culture, and then to go into another country and hear the ways in which gender-based violence appeared there, and then to then come back to the United States and then start working on this project. I think it, it, it opened my eyes to this idea of global stories and global diversity. How are we creating narratives that actually ask us to have those really complicated conversations? Can I ask you a question, Raymond? Um, and, and this is for, for anyone, but I know Raymond does this quite a bit, but um, I, I'm just thinking if there's other like theater practitioners or, or, or artistic programmers who are watching of like, how do you go about finding these stories um, in your own practice? Um, you know, how do you generate these? What, what is in your practice that, uh, that takes you outside of yourself in order to find a story uh, to, to tell that is, you know, not necessarily your own experience. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, I can talk to the work that I'm doing in India. I'm actually currently, Theater Alliance is engaged working with the State Department now on a conversation about uh, diversity, but global diversity and conversations about what global diversity means. Because what happens when we start having conversations about global diversity is the conversations that we're having internally with our own countries becomes a little more muddled, becomes a little more difficult, lacks the nuance that it needs actually on the global stage. And so I think the thing that we are centering is actually going to communities and listening to the stories that actually already exist within those communities. Um, we are, we at Theatre Alliance and I myself am a, a big proponent of holding up stories that exist in communities and, and sharing then those stories, because I think it's in the sharing of these complicated narratives, these narratives that almost sound parallel to mine, but are very different, actually ask me to build a lot of empathy. And so in the, in, in the listening, the cultivation of those narratives and stories, um, I, I find that, yeah, we are working to build empathy in that way. Great. Anyone else want to chime in on that? We have just a, a couple more minutes before we should wrap up. I know Sam has to go soon. Um, but I just wanted to open that up if, if anyone else had a thought on that same same question. Like, how do you find stories that are that that cross ethnic and, and economic um, divides? Yeah, if, uh, right. You know, before I leave leave out of here to go to another engagement, uh, I'll say that it's the the state of the world is so it's fraught right now but i feel like it's so rich and most of my inspiration just comes from keeping my eyes open and being aware of my surroundings and saying yes and like this this opportunity came you, you know rex you called me about this and said hey i'm looking at raymond as a director who's a frequent collaborator and then you mentioned deidre and, and i said wow like this this sounds like a great project that i have to be a part of so as an as an artist i, I think if if you're open i do believe stories will actually come to you uh so yeah just keeping your eyes and ears open it was and great I think to see yeah. See you, Sam. It was a lot lovely to see you again. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank, thank really you so appreciate much, your time. And Bye. Dude, peace and love. Thank you. Sorry, Dee, what were you going to say? Oh, I, you know, just to kind of finish up on that point, I suppose, you know, as a playwright, I mean, um, you, you, I mean, you, you literally pick the stories up off the street, you pull them out of the, 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 the air around you. I mean, stories come in from kitchens, they come in from fields, they come in from schoolyards and factories. And, and the thing about stories in every community, as I'm sure Raymond would echo, is they always kind of pivot around the same fundamentals, you know? It's all about humanity i mean like that's the thing that binds us together whatever color whatever creed you know or or, or whatever you, generation you come from you know we're all human beings and we're all built you know to the same template and and we're all just looking for love and survival and happiness and those stories in every community will always reflect each other because we are all mirrors of each other because we're all part of the same human family. Can I give you another example, Rex, of something that we've um, come across in our uh, work here is that- um, Yes, I would love, please. 1848, the Choctaw Nation heard about the plight of the Irish during the famine and they sent $150, which was a lot of money in those days. And this is from a people who had just recently been through the, um, the um, Trail of Tears and had lost a large, had lost their lands and had lost many of their nation's people who died on that, um, at that terrible time. And yet they, they um, sent this money off to Ireland to, to aid the, uh, the Irish who were affected by famine. And that story still resonates today. And recently, um, an Irish poet, author, Derny, uh, Derny Grefa, published a, a, a book of poems with a Choctaw poet, uh, Leon Ho, Ho. And, you know, both of them addressing that issue together in a collection. And now next month, there's a, a, a book coming out about the, uh, you know, the Choctaw's uh, contribution to Ireland during the famine. There's another 
wonderful story that that uh, you know probably have been lost for a long time. And I had the privilege there a couple of years ago of visiting the Choctaw down in Oklahoma with our Taoiseach, our then Taoiseach um, uh, Leo Varadkar, who wanted to go there to to thank the Choctaw people for the, what they'd done for Ireland 180 years before, 170 years before. Extraordinary. So these kind of stories are ones that we should preserve and, and you know and, and celebrate. Because most people in Ireland probably didn't know about the Frederick Douglass visit until it came back into focus again in recent years. And likewise, people had probably forgotten about the Choctaw story, but that's now being revived in a big way. And I'm sure it'll give rise to, uh, to, to other, uh, uh, other projects. We, uh, we now get a scholarship every year for a member of the Choctaw Nation uh, to study in Ireland. Um, that connection between the two peoples. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that uh, for, for two reasons. One, I'm from Oklahoma as well. I grew up there, but uh, Solus Nua will, we, uh, will be uh, uh, commissioning a, a work on, on a front with a Native American playwright uh, as well to, to uh, the genesis of that Choctaw Irish connection is, is the genesis of that project as well. Um, so uh, we'll, we can't announce all ju just the details yet, but the project is going forward and, uh, and it'll be, we'll have some uh, very exciting announcements soon uh, on, that, on that very uh, front. So uh, that's exciting, yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the, the live session then. Um, if our guests want to stay on for just one moment to, to say uh, hi and, and goodbye and thanks again, that would be great. But for those of you who uh, were watching, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you had friends or family who you think might want to watch this, you can share the, the YouTube link on your, through your social media or email. Um, and if you're not on Solus Nua's email list, you can sign up on our website, solusnua.org. Solus Nua means new light in Irish, and we produce all contemporary uh, uh, Irish work uh, in, across multi-disciplines, theater, film, music, dance, visual arts, literature, poetry, and more. Uh, we are based here in Washington, D.C., uh, but we are proud to partner with uh, folks uh, both in Ireland and uh, across the United States. And especially during this time of, of digital programming, we are proud and, and happy to amplify our, our own work uh, across the world. So uh, thanks for tuning in from wherever you are. And I hope uh, you stay tuned for what's next with Solus Nua. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you soon.